you know, before before you do the intro, I, I miss the old days where I had the elevator music that I would play for everyone. I know. I was just thinking that. Right? Now we have yeah. waiting rooms. I was like, oh, that, the elevator music. That's how they knew they were on one of my webinars. That was your calling card. So we apologize to everyone up front that there is no elevator music right now. You are technically at a Peter Harriman event, even <laughs> if it doesn't sound like it. You are joining another main SBDC webinar, and we have multiple advisors with us today. So we have Center Director and Business Advisor for the USM Center, uh, Peter Harriman, as well as Certified Business Advisor from CEI, Jen Stein. And we are doing a series of webinars to help prepare everyone for wholesale and specifically the New England Made show. So we are partnering with New England Made throughout this to make sure that everyone is ready to go for that trade show, which is coming up soon, just a few months from now. So today we're going to be going over how to prepare your business for wholesale. There are a few other sessions coming up about pricing and all sorts of things. So um, we'll be sharing more information about that along the way, if you're interested. Um, my name is Kelsey Brearden, and I am with the state team, and I'm sure you've gotten several emails from me already. You will continue to get those, so keep an eye out for my follow-up email, and that'll include a link to the recording of today's session, as well as the slides and any other resources we may mention that we want to include. Um, that email will also include all of our contact information, so it'll have Peter and Jen's emails, as well as a request for advising. So if you're not already set up with a business advisor, we highly, highly recommend it. Um, and it's easy to get into our system through that button. So all of that information will be in my follow-up email. If you have any questions today, we're going to use the chat below. Uh, Jen's going to be helping us answer questions there. But if at any point you have another question later on, you can respond to any of my emails and they will all end up in the same place. So we will get you an answer one way or the other. Peter just said hello in the chat. So go ahead and introduce yourself down there. Maybe let us know what part of the state you're in. Um, maybe what, what type of wholesale do you have? If you are brand new versus a, a veteran, we wanna know kind of who's in the room. In theory, you're all preparing, um, but it's always good to hear from people who have experience. Otherwise, I think we are all set to get started. So Thank I'll pass you. it over to Peter. Thanks, guys. Uh, uh, so the purpose of this presentation is to help prepare you, right? Um, now, preparing you is going to be a hard task if you're jumping into wholesale because it's not just this webinar. So you might need to sign up for advising, and we'll we'll get to that in a second. But in this webinar, we're going to talk about wholesale accounts, some common terms, common things that you're going to want to have done before you jump into wholesale. And as Kelsey mentioned, there's a, a few other webinars that we mentioned in this in this presentation and are that are here. The ones that are in the future are the uh, pricing um, for wholesale, which is on the 25th. So in two weeks, we have how to design a booth for wholesale, which is next month on the 8th and Straight Talk, uh, which is uh, people who have been there and done that are going to give their words of wisdom to us. Uh, as we, as uh, Kelsey mentioned, we have partnered with New England Made to help with this trade show to make it the most successful trade show that we can for you, the exhibitors. Um, and like Kelsey mentioned, it is being recorded. We have a chat on, Oftentimes when I do these webinars, uh, people have great questions and I encourage questions because uh, I talk fast as well. So a lot of people say, well, I have to watch it twice. That's okay. That's why we record it and we send it to you and we put it on YouTube. When questions come up, try to make them general questions and I'll certainly get to them. If you have a specific question, that's why I put my email. If you look at my, my face here in the bottom left corner, my email's right there. So if you have a very specific question, just email me and I'll, I'll get back to you. I promise I will. But if it's a general question, by all means, throw it in the chat. We can get to it. We can talk about it. Discussion is often worth its weight in gold. So let's get going. What are we going to cover? An introduction on who I am, who I work for, uh, who Jen and Kelsey are, why we're doing this. Uh, a very small intro on pros and cons to wholesale in case you didn't catch the other webinars that we did on the New England Made and wholesaling. 
Uh, we're going to talk about pricing briefly because, as I said, we have a webinar in two weeks specifically about pricing. We're going to talk about common items and terms for wholesale. We're going to talk about trade shows, and we're going to wrap up with some questions so we can get some, some feedback from you guys. Right. Who I am, my name is Peter Harriman. I'm the Center Director for uh, Cumberland, York County. I'm housed out of USM, and we have uh, Jen Stein with us as well. Jen, you want to just bump in and just say hi? She will be the one manning the uh, chat mostly uh, for the questions. So we get live real time because sometimes in chat, there's like 20 questions that I haven't gotten to yet because I just do the talking. <laughs> so she's the brains, I'm the talker. Okay, let's get going. What does the SBDC do? We provide free business advising, usually one-on-one -on -one business advising, though, as you can see, we do webinars as well. We can help with startups. We help with existing businesses. Basically, your business did not come with a how to do business manual. And that's what we're here for, to provide you either with answers or resources that you can find answers, right? And during the pandemic, we had the EIDL, the PPP, the MERG, the CDBG, the SVOG, the RRF, right? The LMNOP that government comes up with every now and then. So we try, we pride ourselves on staying on top of the most current topics that are pertinent to small businesses and helping advise you on how to deal with those topics, right? What we do not do is offer tax, legal, or accounting advice, right? So during our session, we'll certainly talk about these things, but you might hear us say, well, this is, this is what I understand, but you will want to consult with a, a lawyer, for instance, to go over a contract, right? We have advisors covered throughout the, the state. Now with Zoom, we can you know, virtually meet with anyone anywhere. But if you're the type of person who wants to see people face to face, we have 21 locations throughout the state. So more than likely, you're gonna have an office that you can actually meet someone uh, with you. We are housed throughout the state of Maine by different organizations. I'm from, um, I'm housed by USM. There's CEI, Northern Maine Development Count, uh, Commission and AVCOG, Androscoggin Valley Council of the Government that is housed around us. In 2021, we saw about 3,000 clients, uh, helped create or save 917 jobs, helped generate capital or get loans basically for people, 48.8 million and 136 business starts. And like today, because of the webinar, we have really amped up our online presence of live webinars, which we record and put on YouTube. So we have webinars that are live, YouTube views, um, and we have, 33 over 33,000 views. So it's pretty good. You know, we're like a YouTube sensation. That's great. So where to find advising if you do need advising? This is our, our website. And right in the top right corner is that request advising button. If you click on that, fill out a form, we'll get in touch with you uh, usually within 24, 48 hours to set up an advising session with you. Um, or as I said, you can find us on YouTube. And with YouTube, if you subscribe to our channel, then you'll get notified of any of the new videos that we pop on after we do one of these live webinars. So you can hit that subscribe button and get, get notified. So on with the show. Okay, I promise you, I cleared that up in record time. So let's get going because uh, this is what you really are here for. So wholesale versus retail. Let's just make sure we're all on the same page of what that is, right? Retail is when you sell directly to the end consumer, often called business to consumer or B2C is what you end, uh, often see. Whereas wholesale, what we're going to be talking about today is selling directly to retailers or catalogs or website platforms, right? Often called B2B, right? So uh, the big thing, which we'll get to the next slide, uh, or the slide after, wholesale is not consignment, right? There are some people who talk to me, some clients who are in consignment. That's a different issue that we can talk about on a, a session, a one-on-one -on -one session. Now, a lot of people say, well, why would I even want to wholesale, right? So if you're one of those businesses that are like, I'm thinking about it, but why? Why would I do it? Well, here's some benefits to, whole, uh, to getting into it. One, you don't have to keep as large an inventory right? Yes, you need some samples or you need to show uh, what your most prominent products are. But when someone places an order for 200 units or whatever, you don't have to have those 200 units on hand, right? You just have to make sure you get the units by the time they order it. So it really decreases your need to keep a large inventory on hand because now you're going to be going more for orders. Uh, it increases your exposure, 
because rather than just your website or just your store, now you have your products in other people's stores. So whatever traffic they have, they're now getting exposure for your clients uh, to see your products. It offers you a more predictable revenue stream because as you create more orders and they go out in the future, you get the lead time and the manufacturing time and the shipping time. You actually start creating where it's not guaranteed income, but it's, you know, you're creating like, okay, I know there's 200 orders this month and I think there's 50 orders already for next month. And you start seeing that the income is a little more reliable than just someone coming into the store and buying it, right? So it can lead to predictable revenue stream. And like we've seen in the past, it can, it can diffuse your, your regional uh, market um, exposure, your, your market risk, right? So for instance, uh, California, there's a lot of flooding going on. If that was the only place you had your store, you're shut down, right? Until things get prepared. But if you are wholesaling, there's, your wholesaler could have a larger geographic reach. And so now you're not as at risk for some kind of local event or even uh, a, a national event, because we do have uh, in our training international, you know, if you wanted to go international like Canada, then, you know, if something happens in the US, Canada might be a good market or uh, vice versa, right? So there is a way to minimize that exposure and wholesale is one of the good ways that leads to that. Now, remember, wholesale is not consignment. Like I said, consignment is when you, you know, kind of loan your product to a store and when they sell it, they're going to give you a percentage of that sales. Um, I've seen people do it. Uh, I personally am not a fan if the cash flow is a little unpredictable and you have to rely on the store to kind of tell you, hey, I sold it. Here's here's your, your piece of the pie. Um, there's some insurance and liability questions about, okay, who actually owns the product when it's on their shelf? Um, the exception that I do see with consignment is if you are doing jewelry for very expensive pieces, I do see that work successfully for consignment or artwork um, for a large, uh, a large price, then that's, that's good. But now that we're on the same page as far as what wholesale is, what do I have to do to kind of look at my business to understand should I get into wholesale, right? So the very first thing I tell people, which is why we did an entire uh, a webinar about it in the future, the two weeks from now, is price, right? For me, I'm a numbers guy. I'm sorry, people. That's where the glasses come in. Price. Can you afford to wholesale? Because like the webinar would get into, wholesale is not as straightforward as just retailing your, your B2C, the business to consumer. There are a profit that you need to make, and there's a profit that the retailer that you're selling to needs to make before it gets to the consumer. So the price is a little more complex. So you need to work on that price. You need to look at your capacity. If you get a large order, are you going to be able to fill it, right? I've, I've dealt with people, especially at the show, you know, great, they get an order. When they come in, sometimes it's just a matter of getting more machinery for them. So maybe they need a bank loan for more machinery and they're good to go. But if you're someone who has a very handmade product that takes 20 months to, to, to make, and you only make one at a time, and you can't really train it to someone because it's, it's an art, that's going to be harder to scale up. Um, so you got to think about how many orders can I do and can I accept? And at what time can I turn those in? Uh, marketability, right? A lot of people, when they think of wholesale, they think, oh, I, I, I need to offer them all of my products. That's not necessarily true, right? You could just say, hey, you know, I do offer all these products. So if you otherwise say so, maybe I can work something out. But otherwise, I'm going to I'm gonna just wholesale my three best sellers, right? Vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. The other flavors, you have to come to me to get. But otherwise, if Hannaford wants to put them in, this is the flavors I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry at Hannaford. So you can say, hey, okay, what, what am I going to do? Identity. You have an ideal target client. You have a client where out of 100 people, you can look at this client or you can interact with this client and say, I know this person. is. These are my people. This is my client. Well, when you're looking at wholesaling, you have to keep that mentality with who you're dealing with on the retail basis, right? Are they attracting your clients? Because now you're, you're slightly removed from that. So you want to make sure your clients are going to come into their stores and it's going to match up with what you want for your brand identity, right? So, for instance, we don't want um, hiking L.L. Bean-like stuff in Hannaford necessarily because it doesn't really jive, right? So you got to be smart about 
hey, how do I evaluate my business as far as who exactly would fit best for what my stuff is, right? So again, when we're preparing, we're going to first check the price, right? We'll get to price in a second. We're going to understand some terms. We're going to create wholesale materials. And we're going to decide if we want to do trade shows. And that's how the rest of the presentation is going to kind of go. Pricing is complex. There's price technique, there's price strategies, there's target markets, competition, companies, you know, how you position it, distribution channels, material and labor. And that's not even counting all the fun stuff that likes to pop up like inflation, right? So when we're talking about pricing, there's also strategies, which is like the buy one, get one free or um, half off if you buy one at full retail or whatever, right? Those are strategies versus price point determination, which is understanding what your price is. And again, that webinar is going to talk about this. Oops. Um, so when we're looking at like price point strategy, and again, this is a very high level look, this will get into more detail in the webinar, the, the pricing webinar, but you look at your cost basis, your market basis, which is competitors and your market acceptance. What's the customer perception of what your price should be, right? We're not going to get any more into price so go sign up at least for the webinar. We'll send it to you if you can't make it in person um, for the pricing webinar to understand what your price is and how being a wholesaler is going to affect that price, okay? Now, if you don't go to that webinar, for whatever reason, it's okay. Um, I wanna leave you with at least the two basic rules of pricing for, for uh, any pricing, really. So the market and not your cost determines the price your product will sell. Right. So your product, for instance, I had someone who did organic jam and the price that she uh, or the cost that she had for making that jar of jam was higher than what she could possibly sell it for. So the market, what people are willing to buy is what's going to determine your price. The second thing is your cost is your price floor. So keeping in mind the market is going to determine what your price is. You got to look at that cost because you got to understand, I can't go below this without losing money, right? This is, these are the two kind of laws that we have from our, our great John Entwistle, the man, the myth, the legend. I, I can't go a presentation without mentioning him. Uh, he is uh, a legend at, here at the SBDC. So let's talk about some of the must-have wholesale materials. Right, so these are materials that you're going to create. We'll get into the terms uh, later or the common uh, acronyms that they use. But right now let's look at, okay, if I'm going to go wholesale, what are some of the things that don't exist now that I might have to create to be able to jump in? And those are usually a line, what's called a line sheet, a catalog, an order form, and most people have business cards, but I threw business cards on just in case, right? So what is a line sheet? A line sheet just is a list of all your products, right? And I've seen line sheets with images. I've seen line sheets without images. And, and sometimes they ask, well, why would I put images on? Because it costs more. Well, it's to, to decrease some confusion when they're ordering, right? To make sure they understand, oh, okay, that's that matches up, right? The line sheet usually has item numbers, um, a description. Um, this is actually your number one selling tool. A lot of people think it's the catalog, but the line sheet is actually the number one thing that you want to have for when you're going to be selling stuff. When you're creating item numbers, which are often called SKUs, SKUs, right? These item numbers are, are your own, really. You're, you're making them up. So typically they're eight digits long and you want them to mean something to you right? Because you're making them up. So in the bottom here, I have some examples of SKU numbers, and they're just for you for tracking purposes, basically. So you understand, rather than writing out a dining room table, the wooden one that's light gray, that's small, you can put in the DTWLGS. That is my dining room table, wooden, light gray, small. So the first thing you want to do is look at your inventory and just create a, a SKU number for it. This is different than a UPC code. Right, so on the on the left here, that SKU number is something that you made up. It's unique to each retailer. Um, usually, you can put it in alphabetical order. 
eight digits is kind of my perfect where where you want it. You could get longer if you have a lot of different products. You could get shorter if you didn't think you're going to have a lot of products. Um, but this is not a UPC code. So UPC on the right, um, this is something where any retailer can scan this in, and it's going to it's going to come up right on their on their machine. So they they enter the UPC and it says, okay, this is a uh, large white wooden table. Uh, now, with the UPC code, there's really two ways that you can get a UPC code. Either one, you, you can create one that's unique to your particular product. It does cost a little bit of money. There's another way where you can rent one, where there's a UPC code that might not be being used right now, so you can actually rent it. And uh, after this, uh, Kelsey reminds me, I will get you guys a, uh, a website where you can do that, right? It's a universal website. Uh, but these are always 12 digits long. It's numeric only. Um, I'm not even going to get into uh, what are those things now called, uh, Jen or Kelsey, help me out. The, you can put your phone on it. It gets you to a, a, a website. A QR code. The QR code. I'm not even going to talk about that. Not going to talk about. It. I'm sorry. If you're hoping to hear about QR codes, I'm not getting there right now. But uh, SKU and UPC for now are really the main the main tools that people use uh, for numbers when they're looking at their items. Right now, here's a uh, kind of a uh, a line sheet that I pulled from the internet. Uh, sorry for the the semi not appropriate word but this is the best t-shirt company um and then we have another one right in this one they didn't want to pay for the colors where there were different colors so they put the different colors underneath so you could see the different styles and then you could see that um different as i said than a catalog or brochure so the line item sheet is much more succinct not as much detail usually not glossy Right, it's something that might change. Your prices might change uh, in the in the price line item, uh, whereas the catalog or the brochure that you could create, and this is something again, you you when you go to the if you go to the trade show, especially you'll want these on hand because the price sheet is what you're going to give uh, the retail client so they can look over to make an order. The catalog is usually you want to just make one or two of them so sometimes i see price in them sometimes i i don't see price in it um sometimes i see a catalog where they you can put your price sheet into it right rather because prices again especially with inflation prices tend to change a little bit uh over the year because a catalog is a big investment because you're using high glossy paper usually and it's really good photos you might even pay to have professional photos done so this is uh more of a information uh you know these are these are my different products whereas the price sheet it's getting down to the 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 item number, the different variations, the, the pricing and everything like that. So your line item sheet, you want to be able to print relatively quickly if things change. The catalog is more of, hey, this is like if I'm going to a trade show, this is what's going to be on my table because it gives the best best look of my, my uh, company. Order forms. Order forms are, of course, how someone is going to place an order for you. So these matter if you're going to have especially uh, uh go to a trade show you want to have a physical order form that they can fill out uh and i often see people with uh um you know clipboards and give them give them order forms and the retailer can fill them out but you want to give some pre-thought onto what information do i need on the order form um and we'll get into some of that uh, in a second um but you know, is there a purchase number, a SKU number? Do I need uh, minimum quantities? Where do I want, want my company name? How do I want it to look? Uh, so here's some examples of some order forms, right? Uh, you have your logo, of course, and then you wanna, uh, what I'm talking about is down here, how are you going to organize that to just get the information you need? You don't, you don't want someone filling out, you know, their entire life story when they're doing an order, you want it to be a relatively quick process, whether it's online or it's uh, in this in you know in person. So you want to make sure you have an order form that's fairly easy to fill out, um, and or you can do an online order form, right? Um, 
this is another example of an order form where they made it easy. They just kind of click the boxes that they want. Um, business cards. I know you're, you're a business. Uh, many of you are, are in business and you're like, well, do I need business cards? Yes. Don't get too creative on business cards, right? But when you are at a trade show, especially, or you're out in the public, even not at a trade show, you should always be pitching your business where people are just sick of hearing about your business, right? And if people are sick of hearing your business, that's when you give them your business card and say, okay, well, call me later when you're not sick of it anymore. But your business card you need to have because a lot of times people get interested and they want to talk more, but they need to process it in their mind. So business card with the line sheet, not necessarily your catalog, because again, your catalog is pretty expensive, but business card, line sheet, there you go. Uh, they have everything they need if they want to make an order with you later on. So business cards, if you don't have them, I would, I would have them. I would always have them on you, uh, no matter where you go, right? Now, how to get wholesale accounts, right? So we, we know kind of the different forms and, and materials that we'd have to create. But what do we put into these? Like, how do we get people to do it and, and whatnot? So first and foremost, a lot of people attend trade shows. And that's we're going to talk about that at the very end because we're going to tie into the New England Made Show. Um, a lot of people look at their competition. Like they, they go to Target, let's say, and they look at the shelf that has their products on it. And they say, okay, what brands are they carrying? You know, and try to figure out how to get into that uh, uh, place as well. Uh, some have feedback from clients or from fellow makers. Uh, in Maine, we're pretty collaboratory. So if you're a very small business in a niche market, uh, more than likely, if, if you're not too much of a co competition going on, you can just ask, you know, hey, how did you get into Whole Foods or whatnot? Um, you can check with local cities and travel guides or whatnot. But the biggest thing is you should really develop some kind of tracking method from here on out specifically for wholesale, some kind of tracking method to keep track of the prospects you have and when you follow up with them and what you what you tell them and how you followed up and what you've given them already. Um, I've had someone who kept track of, you know, they just happen to talk about their family. So they write the family stuff. So the next time they talk to, to them, they could say, hey, how is, how is Johnny? Is he doing good in college? Oh, great. Now I want to follow up with you about what we talked about at the trade show or whatnot. So uh, keep track of the contacts you have, right? And, and the efforts that you made, even if you don't make contact with them, oh yeah, I, I tried to contact LLB and I tried this avenue. Cause then, you know, a year later, you might find that avenue and be like, eh, should I reach out again? Well, okay, I'll try, I'll write it down. Um, but it, it lets you know, did I try this already or what have I done or how long has it been? So keep track. Now these are, you're gonna have to listen to me on these. These are, some of the most common terms that I hear when we're talking about wholesale that might not be in your vernacular if you're talking about just running a business normally, right? Normally being uh, business to consumer. So the very top one is minimum orders. Um, MOQ stands for minimum order quantity. And I see these either listed as a price minimum, like, okay, your minimum has to be $500 for to place an order uh, or above, or I see a, like a quantity amount, like you have to order at least three of these or three items from the, from the catalog, right? So minimum orders are very common in wholesale because it doesn't, you, remember, you're not selling directly to a consumer. This isn't the one-off sales anymore. It doesn't make sense from a shipping standpoint, and it doesn't make sense from your pricing standpoint to ship any less than a certain amount, right? So we're, you'd have to go through the cost. And you say, okay, it doesn't really make sense unless I ship six of these, right? Six is my minimum that I really need to ship because it fits nicely in the box I have, uh, which is I know what the shipping cost is going to be and what the packaging is and everything like that. Or it doesn't really make sense if I accept an order less than. $200 or $500 or $1,000, right? So minimum orders, that needs to be right up on your price sheet. Minimum order quantity, MOQ. And again, either a, a, a quantity uh, amount, item amount, or a dollar amount. Reorder minimum is the same thing, right? So maybe maybe I was less uh, less concerned about the quantity in the beginning, 
but to reorder, now I am concerned about it. So if you don't have a minimum first order quantity, you definitely want to have reorder minimums to make sure, again, you, you don't want those one-offs because the cost of, of one is just like selling to a consumer, but you have to share the profit, right? Because remember, you're going to sell it to the retailer, they're going to put it on the store, so you're not making as much as you do when you sell it directly to a consumer, right? Which gets us into minimum retail price, MSRP or SRP, suggested retail price. MSRP is manufacturer's suggested retail price. So when you are selling it to the retail store, you're not selling it for what it is going to show up at on the shelf. And this is a very important, this is one of the number one things you wanna get out of the pricing webinar that we have in two weeks, is when you sell it, that retailer might double that. It's called Keystone. It's two times. So they might double that. So if you sell it for $10, they might double it. And so the end client is going to buy it on the shelf for $20. So you can get ahead of the curve and you can tell that retailer, hey, my suggested retail price is $19.99. Right? So when you put it on the shelf, $19.99 is what, what you should advertise it as. Now, can the retailer on their own decide that they don't want as much profit and they can bring that, they can put a sale on it and say they're going to sell it for $14.99 for a while? Sure. But you're just telling them, hey, you and, and you and all the other retailers I have out there that I'm working with, because hopefully you work with more than just one, $19.99 is, is what I'm suggesting everyone sell it at. So ideally, no one should be undercut in price, right? Because... Target's going to sell it for $19.99 and Walmart's going to sell it for $19.99 and, and whatever. Um, if they want to put it on the sale for their own because they don't need as much profit, that's their thing. But I'm suggesting $19.99 is what the price is, right? Um, delivery window or lead time. Uh, common question that uh, you're going to get if you're uh, doing wholesale accounts. You know, what, what should I expect for a timeline here for you to be able to produce and deliver these manufacturers? or uh, produce and deliver these products, right? If I'm ordering it, if I'm placing an order for 300 now, what, when can I expect them? What's the lead time that you need to make them? Because um, usually it's not a flick of the switch, right? If someone comes in and says, hey, I want 2,000, you're going to say 2,000. Ah, oh, it's going to take me a couple of weeks. <laughs> well, you need to know what is that, you know? And, and sometimes you can break it down to, okay, for every thousand, it's going to be this much time uh, for orders. Uh, but you want to have a good answer. You, you don't want to say, I'll get back to you on that one. You want to say, oh, uh, uh, order for 10,000, that would be uh, two weeks, um, is what we think, with a delivery of another week. So understand what the delivery and lead time is, because that will be a question that you get, because they need to understand when it's going to come to their store and when they can start selling it. Right? Shipping and handling, and we have a, a section on shipping a little later. Um, but well, you want to understand the details of, of how that's going to happen. And again, we got another slide on that later. You know, how is it going to be shipped? Uh, who's going to ship it? How is it going to be packaged? Who's going to pay for the packaging and the shipping uh, is, is all questions that you need to figure out. Uh, same with return policy. How are returns handled? And, and this is hard because food has a whole different aspect of, you know, food goes bad. Uh, or goes past the expiration date, or if there's a defective product, what is your return policy? What if someone just doesn't like it? There's nothing wrong with it. They just don't like it. What is that return policy that you have between you and the retailer, right? Because remember, this isn't the retailer selling to the consumer. You're selling to the retailer, and they might get a return from theirs. How, how are you going to handle that? So you're going to want to have a policy in place for that. Resale certificates. So resale certificates, so there's sales tax, right? Sales tax when you sell to a consumer, that's on one end of the transaction. But on the other end is when retailers are buying from you to then sell to the consumer, the retailer should have something called a resale certificate on file that they can give you a copy of that says, hey, don't charge me sales tax when you sell your items because the sales tax is going to be charged to that end client when they when they buy it from me at Target, right? So don't charge me sales tax. I'm going to charge sales tax later. But you, as a wholesaler, you should get into the habit of, if I'm ever going to not charge sales tax to someone, I should probably have a resale certificate on file, right? And that's when you talk to people and they set you up as vendors. That's what they're doing. They're creating a file for you and they're getting all the information they need 
so that when the main tax authority comes or whatever authority in your state is comes and says, hey, did you charge the appropriate sales tax? You can pull out the file and say, well, I didn't charge sales tax on this order of 10,000 because they have a resale certificate, right? So you wanna make sure you have that. And credit terms, which we'll talk about um, next actually, you know, we want to understand what credit terms we're going to offer to potential clients. So let's get into, into the credit, right? So offering credit to, to sellers, sometimes people get a little squishy about it. You know, it does increase sales volume. Um, it Overall, if it's used correctly and you do your proper vetting of a client, then offering credit to clients, which is kind of like a credit card, right? You're all, they can pay later. Um, it offers an easier selling process. It offers just smoother transaction, but you need to make sure that you're you're properly preparing yourself because you don't want to be stuck holding the bill, right? So you want to think about offering credit if you don't uh, to suppliers, um, but you want to make sure you don't get burned as well. So the benefits for a buyer when they get credit, right? It preserves their capital because they, they don't have to, to pay for it right away when they buy it from you. Walmart is a perfect example of this. Most things on Walmart shelves are paid for after they've been sold, right? Walmart, that's their whole thing. They're paying their suppliers after they've already sold what they have on their shelves. So for the, for the retailer, it helps preserve their capital. They don't have to front the money up up front. Um, it gives them that immediate satisfaction of getting the product on their shelves and then they can pay later. And for them, it's, you know, better service, more convenient and establishes a credit history. But here's some helpful hints for you all, for, for the wholesalers. For the first time order, ask to receive payment before the shipping the order, right? Uh, easiest ways to accept credit cards. And when you're dealing with larger businesses, sometimes they will ask you to use pro forma, right? It's a word that you're probably not used to in the regular run of business. But the pro forma just means that they want you to send an invoice first, and then they're going to send a check, right? Make sure the check clears. But uh, some of the larger stores, especially, they have a process in place. They have a, a machine with cogs that you have to run it through the machine, so to say. Once the first order is placed, most of them, most of the time, they're going to ask for you to switch to net 30, right? To kind of switch to that offering credit terms. Net 30 means that they, they have 30 days to pay, right? Some retailers, I will warn you, when you're dealing with some of the larger retailers, I won't mention names, but they might come in and say, hey, if you want to be with us, you have to do net 30. There's no other option, right? So all of the above is out the window. They, but the the benefit is these retailers are probably good for it because they're big names. They don't want to lose the their names. But long story short, if nothing else, just make sure when you're looking at your credit that you have a clear credit policy, right? And what is a clear credit policy? Well, some components of that policy, right? Develop, you know, some credit standards of who, how you check references, how you understand that this, this potential buyer is good for it, right? Do you check the references or do you just accept them at their word? What are the credit terms, right? If you do net 30 or you do a discount, if they pay 10, you know, 10 net 30, or there's, is there a cash discount if they pay a time of, of sale versus waiting the 30 days? Is there a credit limit that you want to offer so someone can't just run up? Like I, I literally had a business I talked to two months ago who had a too high of a credit limit and someone placed an order and hadn't paid them yet and was trying to place another order. So understand where the credit order is. It was, it was crippling that business as far as being able to get more money to create more products. Um, how do collections work, right? Because when you, when you take on a client, they're going to accept these, this policy, right? Now, again, with some of the bigger retailers, they're just going to slide you their policies and say, this is how we work. You know, do you want to accept it? But when you're on your own, you should have your policies already there in case you're not dealing with these big retailers, right? You're dealing with the smaller retailers. So how do collections work, right? How long pass due before something happens? And when something happens, what is that? Do you charge a fee? Do you charge interest? You know, what 
what goes on. So you really want to make sure your credit policy is pretty well established and that you're able to present that to any potential uh, buyer. Um, shipping, 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 shipping. Okay, we're going to kind of jump. So wholesale shipping, the B2B shipping is not the same, same as shipping directly to clients, right? Because uh, when you ship to clients, it's a one-off usually. Um, you can use UPS, FedEx, DHL, um, not that big a deal. You uh, With business to business shipping, you tend to deal with bigger quantities because now you're shipping like 100, 200 units at a time to one, one particular destination, right? So there is still standard shipping called DTC. So for very small orders, you can probably do some standard shipping, uh, but otherwise you might need to um, talk to a, a bigger shipper, right? And we'll get to that on the next screen. But again, this comes into what your minimum order quantity is, right? And making sure that is right. Because your minimum order quantity, remember, we're trying to do it so it saves on the shipping or it makes sense. Like, hey, it's going to cost me X, Y, Z to ship a, a container this big. I need to fill that, con that container or that box as much as I can. And six items fit in that. So that's my minimum order quantity is six items. Or um, making six items means I get a, a deal on when I buy the product. So when I ship it, I can absorb that shipping cost, right? Or maybe I pass the shipping cost on to my clients, right? I will say because of Amazon, because of Walmart, because of Target, a lot of people now, a lot of your clients are expecting free shipping. So we'll get it into that for the pricing strategy of how do you put shipping into your price without them knowing. Uh, but when you're thinking about this, this is why we have minimum order quantities because we want to make sure if we're going to ship it, it makes sense. Um, double check to make sure there's no permits or licenses. Uh, this is more for international shipments, but I have seen some state to state shipments that get a little funky, especially if you're dealing with plants or food. Um, so you want to check and make sure there's no requirements, uh, you know, Hey, can I ship this to California or not? Um, and if you are packing the shipment yourself, then you want to make sure that it's going to survive the trip, right? That it's properly packaged. It's not, you assume that whoever is shipping it is not going to treat it very well. So package this thing so it can take a tumble. Um, or if you have a nice glossy box, you know, you might want to put it in uh, just a cardboard box because um, the, the outside box is going to get scraped up uh, during the shipping process. Um, so when you're entering wholesale, you want to plan your shipping. Don't just leave it to fate, right? You really want to understand if I get an order, how am I going to do it? If it's an order of this size, maybe I have one process. If it's an order a little bigger, maybe I have another process. Because remember, shipping is also going to tie into that lead time question that you had earlier. What is my lead time? Well, what's your order size? If your order is under this, the lead time is a little shorter because we can use this shipper. If you're if your bigger order might have to do, you know, something like freight shipping, right? So um, on this slide, we have, you know, do can your website is it built to process or handle orders, right? And there's uh, Alibaba, Shopify Plus, Big Commerce. These are just websites that could could help you as far as getting into that wholesale market. And how do I do that? But more to the point, the second bullet is. Are you going to pack your own shipping? Are you going to do drop shipping? Or are you going to hire a distributor to ship, right? Uh, throughout the country, there's people called drop shippers like ShipBob, right? But there's pros and cons to both of those, right? The drop shipper, for instance, is someone where you get an order, you give it to them, they fulfill the order and send it out. Well, I mean, have we ever received a box that was three times bigger than we needed it to be. I have, right? I open up, uh, I won't say the retailer's name, but I open up the box and, you know, there's my lip balm in a box that could fit, you know, a, a huge thing. Uh, well, I, as a business, probably paid for that box that was oversized. So you lose, you know, unless you have a very strict policy, when you're looking at drop shipping, you want to make sure quality control is still there, that you have control over maybe the, the packaging that it's in and what, what goes on there. So there's still homework to do. There's a lot of homework to do of just how do I set up my distribution channel to flow through, 
right? Um, there's just ship. We could go a whole day talking about shipping. So let's continue. Um, when we talk about shipping, there's also what is it going to go in a big container like you see on um, there? Is it going to go international or is it just going to be domestic? And maybe we can we, maybe we can do boxes. So shipping is something that you don't want to leave to the fates. It's something that you really need to incorporate. If you're going to do wholesaling, you really need to think of what your distribution channel is going to be, how it's going to get there, because that's going to affect your price. It's going to affect your lead time. And it's going to affect satisfaction that that people have, right? How many times do you place an order? And if it's too long, you're like, oh gosh, three weeks. Why is it three weeks? Um, now, switching topics. I know I talk fast, but that's because we only got 15 minutes left. So trade shows, right? So should you do a trade show? There's benefits, there's there's drawbacks, right? The benefits are discover new stores or vice versa, new stores discover you, right? So the New England Made Trade Show, perfect example, it is cram packed and a lot of buyers come to look at the vendors, right? The exhibitors. So you have a lot of exposure in a short amount of time to a lot of new stores. So big benefit there. Um, you get to build a mailing list. Uh, that's where you have your card and your price list and you're just handing it out to people who potentially are interested, but maybe not ready to place an order right yet, or they have to check in with the home office or whatever. Uh, press sometimes show up to the trade show and interview you. So that's a, another piece of exposure there. Um, and it just adds a little bit of credibility. You know, when you show up, you're like, Hey, yeah, I'm a legitimate business. Look at my booth. Yeah. So, um, Trade shows have a lot of benefits. Um, some of the cons are it does cost some money, right? Uh, there are booth fees. Uh, you do have to create a display, um, usually with product samples. So the product samples aren't, you usually you have those around, but the display takes time and there's some travel costs involved. So there are pros, there are cons, and you got to outweigh. In business, I always tell people, it's not right, it's not wrong, it's pros and cons, because there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You just got to decide which one's best for you. So if you decide to go to the trade show, what are you going to bring, right? So of course, product samples, bring hammer and screwdriver duct tape. We do have a webinar on this um, that New England Made is going to do. So they are going to cover a lot of this, but I just want to make sure we uh, put something in here. Bring your materials that we just talked about, the price sheet, the catalog, the order form, bring pens, bring paper, bring clipboards, um, design the booth right? Uh, you need to make sure you can visualize the booth before you design it uh, to make sure you get the best booth. But as I said, uh, the next slide will have the, the information on the webinar. But the last part here, remember the three proofs, fireproof, windproof, lean proof, okay, when you're designing a booth. As I said, New England Made is putting on a fantastic webinar on February 8th, on how to design your booth for wholesale. Okay, so I strongly recommend if you're gonna be attending the trade show or you're even thinking about attending a trade show, please go to this website or at least sign up for it to get it because they're gonna go through the, the mechanics of how do you design a booth, you know, right? What do you wanna think about? Tips to remember, uh, people attend craft shows typically for fun. They and trade shows for work. So these are usually people where this is their job is to get orders. So keep that in mind. Um, leave your booth number up. I don't know how many people take their booth number down. Leave it up because uh, you know the, the exhibitors, the, they are gonna get a map of the place and the map has just numbers on it. So they wanna be able to associate the number and understand where you are. Use your corners. Don't put product on the floor. Remember the two foot rule, uh, the buyers will only notice the first two feet, right? Get a tall chair. <laughs> you don't want a chair where you lay down. You get a tall chair because you want to be able to stand up real easy if people come by. Um, that's just my, my kind of tips uh, to remember at the show. Then there's conduct at the, conduct at the show. And again, New England Made is going to go through this as well. But turn your cell phone off. Remember, they're there for work. You're there for work. So it isn't you know, whoever you get to go there, let's say you have staff members that are going to go there, make sure it's the appropriate staff, right? Try to refrain from uh, yes, no questions. Try to do leading questions, right? Bring your, you know, oh, are you interested in uh, leather versus steel? I don't know. 
Um, so you can kind of lead the customer into a discussion. Um, negotiation uh, can help cover any issues in the sale. But the biggest thing on this slide is that last point, close the sale. Just ask for the closing, right? Some people will hem and haw and just say, so let's do this. So you want to, how much do you want to order? Right? Don't be afraid to ask for the sale. And again, you're going to get a great webinar on designing that booth and what to think about. And there's a, the, the final webinar was going to be listen to your peer. So people who have actually built and gone to trade shows, built booths and gone to trade shows, we're going to have a straight talk with them. We've done it before. It's great. Um, New England Made is going to have a, a few people, a few veterans come on, and then they're going to be able to kind of tell you what to expect. And they're going to be able to tell you um, just their experiences with it, right? Because there's usually a lot of hesitation or, on, you know, what what happens? Do I get orders? Do I not get orders? So that listen to your peers is going to be good to, to talk as well. The final thing I'll leave you for boost is three priceless sales techniques. Have fun. Excitement is contagious. Crowds attract crowds and employ as many senses as possible. So have them feel it, have them see it. Um, if your food should be having them taste it, right? If you can. Um, now, when you're at the trade show, these are the common questions that we see people ask. What is a product made of, right? Because the source of the product is becoming more and more important of, hey, is this responsibly sourced or is it sourced from whatever? What is it made of? Um, what's your top selling item, right? So oftentimes they'll have a booth that says, well, they'll have a little sticker or sign that says, this is the number one selling item or this is the most popular. Um, and that that attracts people. They say, oh, okay, okay, I get it. This is the best of the best here. Um, what's your minimum order? Um, how are they manufactured? Some people are very interested in just the process of how they're manufacturing. That might tie into, you know, who you're getting it from, like L.L. Bean. Very interested in is the process, you know, one that has good quality control. Um, and then usually they ask about pricing, of course. And again, we'll get in the pricing webinar, we'll talk about markup uh, and margins and all that fun stuff. So after the show, you want to do a, a kind of an autopsy, one went well, what didn't. Take notes immediately at the show so you, you remember it later on. Have a little yellow pad that you kind of fill out. Um, fulfill the orders you agreed to, but follow up on any leads. Remember that list I told you about when you're doing contact for wholesale? You want to you want to make a list of everyone you're contacting and reaching out to? Well, during the, the show, ask for business cards back. Write some notes on the on the business card about that person. You know, like, oh, this person has a, a dog they really like, and they talked about the dog. And then after the show, follow up with them, right? And you want to follow up in such a way that it, it creates a, a need for them to follow up with you, right? It's called a call to action. Why, why are you reaching out? Are you reaching out just to say hi? No, you're reaching out because it's your business and you're hoping they're going to place an order. Right, maybe introduce a new product. Like, hey, at the show, I didn't have this product. Uh, what do you think about this? Right. Always remember your current accounts, though. Great to to run after new accounts, but you already have clients. Keep them happy as well. So don't forget about them. So, in summary, I know I talked really fast. I'm sorry, but in summary, prepare, prepare, prepare. Do your homework. There's a lot of there's a lot of decisions that need to be made. It's not just, yeah, I'll do wholesale one day. It's, I think I want to do wholesale, but let me look at the shipping, the cost, the pricing, who I'm going to do it with. You know, there's a lot of different things there. Do the math. Make sure the math works out. If the math doesn't work out, then, you know, you either got to work with maybe a, an advisor to figure out, okay, how do I get into wholesale if my math doesn't work? What can I do? There's ways you can do it, but it's going to be a longer time frame than you originally might have thought. And of course, create your forms, create your booth if you're going to go to the trade show, but make sure you have those on hand because those are often asked about. But you have to do all the other stuff first before you create those forms. Uh, okay, I left you like five minutes for questions. Thank you, questions, comments, thoughts. And as we we kind of, I know I've seen the chat kind of going, as we're, we're talking uh, and our, our questions are coming in, 
I do want to say, you know, the SBDC is not the only game in town. There's a Veterans Business Outreach Center, the Women's Business Center, and SCORE. We all are under the SBA umbrella, and we all play nice in the sandbox in Maine anyway. So uh, these are all resources that you can also uh, reach out to. But, of course, the SBDC is, is you know, kind of near and dear to my heart because I am the SBDC. So the SBDC is, uh, you know, the, our website, our telephone number. Remember that request advising button um, if you want to request advising. And for you, because I know some people are probably or maybe outside of the state of Maine that are listening to this webinar. So there's an SBDC in every state. So here is a list of the, the just the New England states because it is a New England made trade show. If you're outside of this area, then uh, anywhere else at the bottom would do. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back to the, I'll just leave it on that one, I guess. Um, as we just kind of sit back and say, okay, now Pete can kind of permit a bush and listen to you and answer some questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Pete. Um, Jen's been answering a lot of the questions in the chat as they come through. So if there was anything that was not clarified, I would recommend sticking in the chat again. I'm trying to go through and check. Um, we got a lot of thank yous that this was super helpful. We also had um, uh Stefa from New England Made helping answering some questions in the chat about um preferences. We were talking about uh, sharing those lists, um, the best way to share uh, versus, so I guess I'm trying to find the exact uh, thing to quote. We were talking about the line sheets and catalogs and how is the best way to get that to new clients. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like people are using QR codes in their booths, that there's uh, um, those calls to action uh, are definitely working. Uh, Steph yes. uh, did mention that people are afraid to click attachments. So in yes. this cybersecurity environment that we are all learning to navigate, uh, you're not supposed to click on attachments if you've gotten them from a stranger. That's like a new rule that we should all be following. If you didn't know that, <laughs> don't click on attachments from strangers. Um, but in this case, you may be, you may need that information. So making it really accessible to people in a non-scary way will definitely help. Um, and QR codes are great, um, especially if you make like a promotional video for your uh, business and you have that and they can do it. Like, especially uh, people get fascinated with how you manufacture your product, especially, right? Whether it's, whether it's a food product or a, a materials-based product, like they like to see that process. Just to know, hey, it went from this and now it's this fine-tuned product at the end, right? So um, oftentimes I see either pictures of the process in, in booths sometimes, or if you did a video, you could do a QR code that links to the video. Um, I didn't include QR codes because it, it sends you to a link to a to a, a website. So I thought, mm, I don't know if we're here yet, but next year we'll include it in the in the webinar. Yep, and then. Um... So uh, I'm a fiber artist. I've set up at different craft fairs, never a wholesale fair, but um, I print out my like pricing sheets or any QR codes for that kind of information. And I put them in pretty frames that match my branding and my aesthetic so that there's like a picture frame on my table and that cue card is there. So even if I was talking to another client, someone who comes to the booth by and doesn't talk to a human could still get that information just by taking a picture with their phone. So it's definitely helpful. It does seem like we had a lot of people from different states. We got like all of New England covered. So thank you all for joining us. We hope that you found this helpful. Like Peter said, um, every state has their own SBDC and their centers throughout each state. Um, so definitely get in touch with your local chapter. Uh, two questions that came in towards the end. For accounts who present... Uh, who present with a contract, I'm not sure that I totally understand. Basically, uh, if there's a contract that requires U.S. shipping to be covered, should we build that into the unit price? Does that make sense? Uh, uh, well, well, with the shipping, um, shipping is kind of this weird animal, right? Us, not U.S., sorry. 
requires lot, us to do commerce shopping. To us, not to us. us. Oh, um, so if they're requiring you to pay for the shipping, you the the wholesaler, I personally would put it into the price, right? Because otherwise, it's just going to come out of your profit. If if it wasn't built baked into the price already, if they're going to require it, of you. so. Shipping is one of those weird things. Everyone expects, in, in the U.S., I should say, everyone expects free shipping because of Amazons, Targets, Walmarts. So my rule of thumb for most of my clients that I talk to is just bake that into your price so you can offer free shipping as a, as a boom, right? Even though it technically isn't free because it's in the price already. So look at the shipping and look at the price. Now, if it's shipping where you're you're only shipping to a small amount of people and then the, the usual stuff is there, then that's a whole different thing that we can talk about probably on a one-on-one -on -one advising. Um, or if it's a special order that's overseas and it's just that order, we can talk about that. But typically, I like to see it baked into the price now just because everyone expects shipping to be covered. That makes sense. Um... And it seems like well, you... let's, let's put it this way. I recently shopped and I saw shipping for three ninety nine on one of my products. I was like, no, I'll just <laughs> I'm not going to do it. It's just three ninety nine, but I, it was still like paying for shipping. So, uh, but again, there there might be in this particular case, it sounds like a, a unique thing or uh, or something particular to you. So maybe reach out to me. Um, but otherwise, shipping usually just bake it into the price. Sorry, go on. <laughs> No, that all makes sense uh, to me. Um, we do have someone who sells a craft alcohol. And so they were looking, it sounds like that's not a fit for New England made, um, but they were hoping, they were wondering if there were any other crossover markets. And so Jen mentioned maybe like the food and wine show. Um, there are a lot of different types of shows like that. this. So it would be, it would behoove you to check out within a few states around you these types of programs and when they are throughout the year and see if you can get into a couple throughout the year. Like Peter said, diversifying your clients is key. So one wholesale uh, account is great. Four or five wildly different ones would definitely be better. Um, so they're going to investigate. Awesome. I... Um, I'm trying to find, I think that Jen answered all the other questions. I'm not seeing any that weren't addressed, but if there's anything, go ahead and stick those in the chat. Everyone's saying, thank you. It is 12 o'clock. So we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, yeah. like I said, you'll get a follow-up email from me that will include the recording and the slides. Um, and I also jotted down a note, something... Peter wanted to send out a universal UPC website that Peter's going to share oh, yes. with me that I'm going to yep. share with you. Um, you uh, that, you so we'll you. make sure you get all of that information. Yep. Otherwise, we hope that you will join us. I was kind of snickering. We got a lot of people sign up for the how to price your your wholesale uh, <laughs> webinar during this webinar. So we're so glad that you're going to be coming back. We hope to see you yep. all again. Uh, like we said, there are a number of sessions with this partnership and all of those links to register will be in my follow-up email. So at the bottom, there'll be all the upcoming events and all of those will be there. So if you missed anything, it'll be easy to access. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I think we're all set for today. Yep. Yep. All Thank right. You. Thank you all. I will say um, I have seen... Uh, something unique come out of this, you know, you keep hearing about um, supply chain disruptions, right? And that has actually created an opportunity for local wholesalers, where if these large distributors are having troubles, especially shipping things through, uh, you know, the big ports that have backups of ships, and that's going to be months, but well, wholesalers have been picking up the slack. So even if you think it's like, ah, I can never be in Target, give it a try. They might be having trouble getting some of the products in. So they would be open to dealing with a smaller, more local wholesaler who can, who can not guarantee, but, you know, ease that supply chain problem that they have at this time. Yeah. You may actually have the upper hand in this mm -hmm. case as a smaller producer. Yeah. And, and shipping costs have come down over the last few months, but 
in a time in 2021 there, uh, last year or two years ago now, uh, there was a time shipping tripled or more for international shipping. If you're shipping any products, uh, uh, well, even domestic shipping went up. Uh, that is thankfully eased a little bit. Um, but if you are thinking about international, then I would suggest the web webinars that we do on international trade. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Stefa. Thank you, New England Made. Thank you, everyone who joined us. We hope you have a great day.